No, and I think we are almost ready for our speakers. Jim. Thank you very much, both Stu, and thank you very, very much, Paul, both for being here and for the wonderful comments this morning. One of the things that many of you, I'm sure, are aware is that the field of neuroscience is a field in evolution. It's also a field in many ways that deals with evolutionary perspectives, evolutionary perspectives of brains and minds uh, across the phyla, certainly evolution of the human being, not only in terms of our previous evolution, but our ongoing evolution. And here, once again, we encounter neurotechnology. How is it that through our science and technology we change the human predicament, the human condition, perhaps the human being? Can the field of neuroscience in some way leverage some purchase to insight what is important for the function of humans in their environment, in their world, as part of the naturalistic order? Can neurotechnologies, in fact, provide insight to the way brains create, evoke, channel, generate consciousness in the mind. And in so doing, does that then give us some insight to those things that we as a species hold dear? What we hold to be valid, veridical, our values, and how do we then utilize this information in the larger biopsychosocial sphere that is the reality of the human condition? Well, very recently, We've learned that neuroscience, in fact, provides some partial answers. All of them? No, certainly not. We're still confronted by what philosopher David Chalmers refers to as the proverbial hard problems and hard questions. How does the great stuff arise from the gray stuff? And indeed, we're struggling with those things, but we still have the practical issues to deal with at hand. Neuroscience and neurotechnologies are strong social forces and are affected by strong social forces. Thus, the idea of neuroethical, legal, and social issues becomes paramount when leveraging these technologies in ways that can evoke good for the public and perhaps burdens, risks, and harms for the public, if not humanity and the world at large. So an important step, then, is to recognize that investment back into neuroscience and neurotechnology needs to be not only a current agenda item, but a future agenda item, as the space, scope, depth, and momentum of the science and technology gains, increases, and exerts influence in a variety of dimensions of the reality of our world. But it may also be a useful tool, a tool to peer in to ourselves, one of the things that I'll offer to you repeatedly throughout the course of the day is that neuroscience and neurotechnology is both a lens that has a variety of granularities that allow us to look at humans, other species, and do so in a way that is objective, but at the same time, it is a mirror by which we can look at ourselves and perhaps estimate ourselves through a new yardstick and set of metrics. Our first speaker this morning is Professor Greg Burns. Dr. Burns is Distinguished Professor of Neuroeconomics and a Professor of Economics at Emory University. His ongoing work explores the capacity of neuroscience and neurotechnology to be able to peer into those substrates and mechanisms that are important to human values decisions, values desiderata, cognitions, emotions, and behaviors. Please welcome our first speaker, Greg Burns. Well, it's great to be here again. Um, I think it's been a couple of years uh, since I was last here speaking. So um, what I'd like to do is talk to you about some ongoing work in neuroimaging that my group has been doing over the last couple of years. And as you can see from the title, trying to understand uh, what we call brain culture interactions, and specifically using neuroimaging technology to understand this interaction of how the individual and society and culture relate to each other, and can we map one onto the other and back and forth. Um, everything I'm going to talk about today involves brain imaging. Um, I'm not going to give an overview of how brain imaging works. That would take uh, an hour in and of itself. So if you have any questions about functional MRI or, or neuroimaging, please ask me. Um, but I'm not going to spend any time talking about the technology itself. You'll have to take my word for it that it's well established and um, has been around for 20 years, although there continue to be naysayers about it, but I will um, dispute that. The goal of what we're trying to do is really understand um, this uh, closed loop. 
So um, individuals um, appear in this, in this um, loop in many different ways. And there are different levels that we can study the brain and specifically how the individual relates to society. Um, the primary way that we're interested in is this part of the uh, interaction here. Um, we're interested in how people make decisions and specifically how people represent their beliefs in the brain and how that maps onto the decisions that they actually manifest. And ultimately, we're interested in how those decisions relate to groups and ultimately how groups relate back to the individual. Now, there are many levels that one could potentially study this type of uh, interaction biologically, all the way from the genome um, to cells to the brain. And we're going to be operating at this level right here. So I'm going to tell you about two different studies. And so I'm going to blaze through these rather quickly. Um, and they represent two very different ways of approaching this problem. Um, the first is a study of what we call sacred values, and I'll, I'll define that in a minute. But basically, um, sacred values is looking at the effect of um, social norms on individual decision making. The other one that I'm going to touch on is actually more recent developments, and that is can we kind of reverse the direction of understanding and causality and look at brains to understand actual cultural trends. And this starts to move into the direction of forecasting and prognosticating cultural trends. If you take the idea that we're all, indiv all individuals embedded in some type of society and we're all kind of sampling what's happening in culture in the world at any given moment, that, that if we get a reasonable number of people together and put them under the scanner, that in essence we start to get understanding of, of cultural developments um, in the brain. So let me, let me start by talking about sacred values. And uh, this work was recently published in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. And there's an entire issue on uh, the biology of cultural conflict, um, if this sort of thing interests you. So here's the problem. Historically, how do we know what a person believes? Historically, there's really only two ways that we know what a person believes. It's either what they say or what they do. And if I want to dichotomize um, uh, schools of thought, we can put the, uh, what you say in more of the psychological realm of study and what you do in more of the economic uh, realm. So economists um, are famous for saying um, it really doesn't matter what people say because talk is cheap. The only thing that matters is what people do. And that's the economic way of, of revealing true preferences. Whereas psychologists might say, well, yes, it does matter what people say because we have subjective um, feelings, we have subjective thoughts, and we have kind of the feeling that we have a continuity of actions and subjective states that only we know about, but that somehow maps onto our actions. So the goal here is to kind of um, look in between this and try to understand what's going on in the brain by, in essence, kind of sidestepping both these issues and then ultimately coming back to that to understand how the brain represents that. Most of our prior work um, has been focused on economic decision making. Um, there's several reasons for that, um, one of which is a matter of convenience in that economic decisions are relatively easy to study in a laboratory and they're relatively easy to study when you have someone in an MRI scanner because you can just ask them to make various types of economic decisions. You can show things on a computer screen and ask them to make choices about uh, monetary decisions and we all take it for granted that more money is better, although how much more varies depending on the person's um, attitude towards money and, and risk. Um, but there certainly are limitations to the economic framework for understanding decision making. One of the biggest ones is that we all know that there are many decisions, many important decisions that simply are not based on financial or material incentives. And this takes us into the realm typically of religion and politics, national identity, ethnicity, things that many people would call sacred. Um, so. What is a sacred belief? Well, there are many different definitions, but kind of very loosely we can say that they are typically abstract, that they don't exist in terms of kind of um, mundane or um, 
financial types of outcomes, and they typically are non-compromisable. People will not um, compromise. They will sometimes sacrifice their life for them. There are many different types of sacred values, and it depends on the culture. Um, sanctity of human life is a common one. And I don't, I don't want to imply that any of these things are universal. That's not the point of this talk. Um, these are just common ones. And since the subjects of most of our experiments are uh, U.S. citizens, uh, people living in metropolitan Atlanta more specifically, these just tend to represent um, sacred values in that part of the country. So we have sanctity of life, human life, animal life. Um, marriage is an interesting one. I don't wish to imply that this, there's anything particularly sacred about it, but because there are different, it takes on different forms depending on your point of view. But what's important about it is that whatever your viewpoint is on issues like this, most people are fairly resolute about that um, particular point of view, and, and most people will view it as sacred. This is an interesting one because it's changing culturally. Um, there are other types of, of sacred values that actually do map on to actual economic behaviors um, because uh, depending on the religion or the beliefs, you actually do have to go out and buy things that manifest in terms of those beliefs. So we have kosher food, for example. Um, although people will often say these are sacred, they're really <laughs> not. Um, <laughs> so these, these go in the category of non-sacred. These are what we would call preferences. Now they may be strong preferences. I have yet to hear of someone willing to die for Apple. Um, so we can make several predictions about it. Um, we're interested in studying sacred values because they represent an important um, domain of decision making that really hasn't been well studied with brain imaging. And we would like to know how that can possibly map onto important decisions. There are big challenges to do this um, because the things that people view as sacred um, are not typically things that you can give in any kind of demonstrable way in a laboratory setting. It creates certain challenges, which I'll tell you about in a moment. But we can make some predictions about sacred values. And we actually can draw on um, several millennia of, of philosophical thought on this issue. And I'll boil it down to make it um, very simple and very dichotomous so we have some very clear hypotheses about how this might manifest in the brain. There are essentially two ways that an individual might make a decision based in what we would call a sacred value. So let's, let's just kind of, uh, let's take God as, a, as the quintessential example for this uh, community. You can make a decision based in religion um, with two kind of uh, thought processes in mind. One is what we call a deontic or deontological mode of thinking. The deontic uh, philosophy says that people do things because they are the right things to do. It has nothing to do with the consequences of the action. It exists as some kind of categorical imperative, to use the words of Kant, that there are essentially rights and wrongs, and you do them because it is the right thing to do, or you don't do it because it is the wrong thing to do. And that is essentially where the thought process stops. That can be in contrast to what would be called a utilitarian uh, mode of thinking. And this is quite different. So you might do something, not because it is the right thing to do, but you do it because of the consequences. So let me give you an example. Um, you can do this, I do this with my kids. And this is actually one of the questions that, that we pose in our experiments. Would you kill an innocent human being? Now most people will answer this question, no. But that doesn't tell you anything about how they come to that decision. There are two ways to do it. You can just say, well, no, that's wrong. I would not do that, and that's pretty much the end of it. So think of that as the Ten Commandment um, of way of thinking. It's written in stone, execute that rule, you don't have to think any more about it. Or you could say, well, no, killing is against the law, I would go to jail. Um, that would be more of a sociopathic way of thinking about it. Um, 
you could still in a utilitarian framework say, well, no, it would cause harm to the victim's family, it would be bad for that, it would be bad for a lot of people. That is not deontological, that is thinking about the consequences and essentially making a cost-benefit analysis and still coming to the same conclusion, but it's an entirely different way of thinking about the problem. The question that we're interested in is how do people naturally think about these questions and how do they solve these um, problems in their daily life? It's extremely hard to know because most people don't encounter questions like that very often. Um, and if you pose them hypothetically, um, it's very subject to how you frame the question. So just the example that I gave you, you, know, you, you can think about the question in either way. Um, neither one is right or wrong, they're just different ways of approaching the problem. So we can make predictions about how this maps in the brain. Specifically, deontological processing should map onto rule systems because it is at the heart of deontic way of thinking. There are rules, these are essentially what we call semantic knowledge. You have to look up what is right, what is wrong. Think of your Ten Commandments written in stone. You have to kind of index which commandment um, is at play and then execute that rule. That should look very different than utilitarian processing, which should be associated with circuits in the brain that are associated with valuing things or utility, and you have to do cost-benefit analyses. We know a lot about these regions since, um, like I said, economic decisions map onto uh, these parts of the brain. So there's actually a large literature in both um, these realms, although none having much to do with sacred values. Um, the first one, the deontological, is associated with rules, rule processing, typically in making moral judgments, um, but not always. Uh, a number of studies have shown regions, specifically in the left prefrontal cortex, regions very near, but not exactly on language regions, um, associated with rule judgments. And rule judgments can take many forms, and many of, many of these studies, um, they actually use things like road signs, um, grammatical judgments, all of these things are uh, based in some kind of rule structure where there's a formal set of, of rules that are given and people have to make judgments about whether they're correct or not. And there seems to be some consensus that, that these regions, um, like I said, they're closely associated with language, they're not exactly, um, which makes sense because language, you know, the, the defining characteristic of language is that there's grammar and syntax and there are rules. Um, so a lot of the thinking is that these, these regions have evolved um, to function in many different realms where rules have to be used. Um, the utilitarian system is quite different and is most closely associated with regions uh, rich in dopamine as signaling value of potential outcomes. And these regions um, are in areas that we call the nucleus accumbens, again, very rich in dopamine. Um, parts of the uh, prefrontal cortex much lower, and these should be easily distinguishable. So how do we study this? Um, the challenge is, is when we throw up statements like that, um, it, it, it evokes all sorts of, of processing. Now, the question is not whether you believe in God or not. That's not particularly interesting for our study. The question is, which circuits do you start to activate? Do you think about God in terms of heaven and hell? Um, you know, if I do something, then this is going to happen. I'm going to go to heaven or hell. Um, or do you think of it in some kind of other way? Do you think of it in terms of rules? Um, or do you just not care? Um, so these are the, the way our experiments actually work, where we have individuals in the scanner and we show them these statements. And the goal is to determine how people naturally process statements like this completely devoid of any specific instructions about it. Later, we can then ask them to make choices about it. So this is where we actually get their, what they truly believe by their um, own kind of choices. So how do we know if it's sacred or not? So we can ask people this is a hypothetical question at this point. Um, 
The reason it's included, um, I'll be honest with you, I don't think that the, this hypothetical question actually tells us very much. Um, it's there primarily to link it to, to um, previous uh, literature in which people actually do experiments in the field and go around and ask people questions like this. Um, but it gets you thinking, is there a hypo is there amount of money that you would accept to essentially compromise what might be sacred to you? That's interesting, but it's not that interesting. Um, what our experiment is actually about, since we acknowledge that we can't really know what a person believes, and we can't measure that, so the prior statement doesn't really tell us that much, the one thing that we can do is actually change the, the, the experiment from a hypothetical one of, of, of a question of would you take money or not, to actually offering money and actually putting it on the table. So one way that we can measure whether something's sacred to a person or not is whether they have integrity for that value. And integrity is kind of a vague concept, but we'll make it very concrete here. And that is, if I ask you to sign a document with all your personal values listed on it, so in the actual experiment, we go through about 100 questions like this. And you, in the end, you choose which ones um, characterize your values, and then you sign a piece of paper. Um, attesting to this. And the types of things that we ask range from are you a Mac or a PC person, dog, cat person. The God question's in there, but it also, we also have much more interesting things. We have questions about abortion, gay marriage. Um, we have the question about taking an innocent human being's life. We have questions about um, selling um, uh, 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 U.S. secrets to a, a hostile foreign country. Um, and we have kind of some very extreme statements um, because we didn't believe that people would care about it. So we have statements like um, having sex with children. You know, we thought to include these statements because we thought it would be very unlikely that anyone would ever sign their name to a statement like that. So we have to kind of probe the range of, of human values. And where it gets interesting is when we actually put money on the table, real money. So we all know that money changes everything, right? Um, and this is really the measure of integrity. So prior to signing this document, they've come out of the scanner at this point, um, we have what we call an auction for each value. So we go through everything, we say, okay, you said you believe in God. How much, how much money will it take for you to change that answer and then sign your name to it? and you can get up to $100 per answer. Um, so people start thinking about this. And essentially, if they refuse to take money, if they opt out of our auction, that is our measure of sacredness for that person. It's actually a measure of integrity, but it, that stands as a proxy for it. And then we can go back and then look at the brain activation to those items that they subsequently refuse to sell. Um, so this is what that, that looks like. You previously stated you believe in God. Tell us a dollar amount between one and a hundred dollars that you would accept to change your answer to that, or you may opt out. Okay, so um, lots of stuff were done. We, um, we actually followed up with, the, with our subjects almost a year later um, to see if their values had changed. Um, and as you might expect, the things that they refused to sell were very stable, whereas the things that they did sell tended to flip around a little bit more. We go right to the demographics. Um, if any of you um, have read brain imaging studies, you know that these are typically small sample sizes. Um, we did a little better here. We have an N of uh, 43, although we did uh, validate this in a much larger online survey of over 300 people. So. Um, it's fairly well validated now. Um, our demographics are a little bit skewed. Um, one of the problems that we always have with these experiments is who volunteers for them. Um, the online versions are a little better, but when it comes to actually getting people to come into the laboratory and go in an MRI tube, um, not so good. Um, and one of the problems in kind of the future areas of research is trying to reach out to other populations that typically don't want to come into a scanner. So what do, what do people do? 
Um, what's interesting about this is that it's very much a bimodal distribution where um, people tip, these are the ask values. That, so zero in this category means that they'll take any amount of money um, to change their answer and then the opt out is they won't take any money. So you see kind of this bimodal distribution where people typically tend to just kind of categorize, I'll either take money or I won't take money. And then there's this kind of tailing distribution where people actually do start to think about, you know, the relative value of their values, you know, at least in terms of money, which is kind of interesting. But mainly we're just going to contrast these things versus those things. Um, one thing that we can do is compare their hypothetical answers to whether they actually took money. And one of the things we observe is there's something called hypothetical bias, as you might expect where people answer the hypothetical question, no, no, I, won't, I would never do that. I wouldn't take any money. And then when you actually put money on the table, they do take it more often than they thought they would. So these curves um, are plotting um, the, uh, the actual um, time they would take money versus hypothetically. So this tends to be, these tend to be greater percentage. Um, so the things up here, these are like the Mac PC questions where they said, yeah, I would take money, and they actually do. And then the things down here are uh, what we would call the sacred. They hypothetically said they don't take money, and they actually don't. Um, so, you know, we have things down here. These are pedophilia questions, hurting animals. Um, North Korea should be nuked. Um, there's all, sort, all, all sorts of things. If anyone's interested, I can give you the actual um, questions we used. Um, so really all we want to do is compare um, the brain responses to the things that were sold versus not sold. And we know um, previously where to look. Um, and this is, this is what we get. So I've color coded this to make this um, easy, easier to follow where the yellow regions are regions that we see active um, to things that people did not sell out. So these are the sacred um, things to the, those individuals and what we would call using deontological networks. And it turns out that these are essentially the same areas that I showed you at the beginning. They're rule-based areas. This area um, is the left ventrolateral prefrontal cortex and this area is what's called the temporoparietal junction. Very closely associated with rules and many researchers believe this particular area has to do with moral rules in, in particular. Um, so we can see those as being more active to the items that people refuse to sell. Um, there's actually kind of one kind of area that shows up that's very interesting, um, the amygdala. Um, so for the, the neuroscience geeks here, you know, the amygdala is closely associated with arousal, typically negative arousal. So arousal just means that the body um, is jacked up, heart rate goes up, um, breathing goes up, um, et cetera, can be for good or for bad, mostly for bad. And what we see is the amygdala activates um, to the opposite statements of the things that people viewed as sacred. So what that means is if you believe in God and you refuse to sell that statement, when we show the, the opposite of that that says you do not believe in God, that's where we see the amygdala activating. And the implication is, this, is that's the those are the very specific subcategories that cause the most arousal, most physiological arousal, because they are the most repugnant to the person. So what? What does any of this mean? Does this have any practical implications? Well, we think it does. I mean, it tells us a great deal about how people represent um, non-financial um, decisions in the scanner in a very specific subset of people, but what does this have to do with what they really do out in the real world? It's very hard to know because there's no way that we can follow people and observe their religious practices. We don't know how they're voting, et cetera. But we actually did collect data on kind of generally how active they are in the community. And the one thing that came out of all of this is there, there's actually a positive correlation what we call their, their activist score. So what, what the activist score is, is we simply ask people, this is based on something called the World Value Survey, that asks how active you are in 
a number of group organizations. And it can be professional, it can be athletic, arts, political, religious, doesn't really matter. There's kind of a list, I think, of seven of them. And the individuals just say, not active, mildly active, very active. And it turns out that, the, and we just add those all up, so it can go from zero to 14. The people who are the most active in their community or groups are the same people who had the most activation in that rule-based region I showed you. So this is very interesting because it suggests that the degree to which you activate and represent rule processing networks in your brain is associated, positively associated with how involved in group activities you are. So if you're a um, social psychologist or anthropologist, the implication is, we, we, we actually don't know the direction of causality, but if one were to speculate, you might think that um, the more involved in groups you are, the groups are essentially the, the mechanisms that rules are transmitted and embedded in the individual's brain. So it's, it, it actually does have a real world um, applicability for understanding perhaps what types of individuals might actually act on these beliefs or have the strongest beliefs because of this positive association. Okay, um, so those are the conclusions for that study. Now I want to move on and talk about something entirely different from the other direction. So what I just told you about was looking at the relationship of how society and culture essentially embeds rules in the individual's head or brain. The other way to look at it is can we look at individuals' brains and understand something about society? So this is, we're using an entirely different medium here. Um, why should this work? Well, we know from many studies in individual decision making that these same networks that I just told you about that represent value and utility, these uh, dopamine-rich regions, when they're active, they will often predict what an individual will do in a very specific, constrained way. And there's several studies that have looked at this with regards to purchasing behavior. So one study, you can't really see it very well here. These are pictures of Godiva chocolate. Um, this is from Brian Knudsen's group. Basically, when people are shown objects that they, have, that they will have the opportunity to purchase at the end of the experiment, there is, a, there is a positive association with the degree to which these specific structures activate and the likelihood that they will purchase that item at the end of the experiment. So the idea is that when people are shown prospects of this, um, these regions activate and somehow measure their kind of expected utility from that object and that will index their likelihood of acting on that in, at the end of the experiment. Similarly, um, other experiments have done, been done where um, s regions nearby in the, what's called the orbital frontal cortex also represent the amount of money or willingness to pay that an individual um, will offer for, in this case, um, a bottle of wine. So there's ample evidence that we can identify signals in individuals' brain that suggest their individual decision making. The question that we're after is can we use similar signals not only to predict what those individuals will do, but what everyone else in society will do? Big difference. Okay. Is there any reason to expect this to work or not work? Well, if we've done our experiment well, it should, because um, if we gather up enough people that are in any way representative of the population that we're interested in, it should work, because if they're representative, then if we get enough of them, then we should get a good idea of what the population will do. Um, we do have this issue that um, when we look at individuals, there's a lot of differences in brain activation. And all the pictures that you see and that I've shown you tend to boil it down to the commonalities. So we don't know how to deal with that. Um, the third problem, kind of technical problem, is what can you possibly measure in the population that you could then link back to an experiment? So these are all just technical questions. So we actually used music um, to do this experiment because it meets all those uh, criteria. It's ubiquitous. People have strong preferences for it. You can measure those preferences. 
you can measure preferences in society. That's what the billboard rankings are. Um, and you can have very concrete measures. Uh, you can know how, much, uh, how many songs have been sold um, in society. We just, pay, we just pay Nielsen to tell us that. The other thing that's interesting about music is it's very social as well. It's not simply just a solitary experience. All right, so the way we did this experiment, this was a multi-year affair, and much of this was an accidental discovery. Um, we downloaded songs from MySpace back in 2006 when MySpace was still popular. Um, we used MySpace because we wanted primarily unsigned artists that people would not have heard on the radio at that point. All different genres. Um, we determined the popularity of the songs by how uh, much it had been downloaded, converted it to a five-star rating, and then we extracted 15-second clips from each song um, and then played these songs. Now, our target population for this is actually a group of adolescents. Um, this was part of a different, a different project. It was actually uh, the original purpose of the project was to understand peer pressure. Um, and this is what it looked like, kind of what this is a timeline, um, where this is a trial. Um, so the person would, would be in the scanner, they'd hear the song, then they would rate it on how familiar it was to them, then how much they liked it, then they would hear it again. Sometimes we would show how popular it was, um, and then sometimes we would show, we wouldn't show that. That was, that was the original experiment. I'm not actually going to talk about the original experiment results. Um, what we're going to do for this one is just focus on this, the initial listening. What happened was we did the original experiment, published it, and then um, I heard one of the songs in American Idol, um, which I guess in retrospect, shouldn't have surprised me, but at the time, it really did surprise me. Because when we did the experiment, all the artists, as far as we knew, were unsigned. So somehow we went from having an unsigned artist to having a song that was so popular that got played on American Idol and made me realize, hey, you know, we have data from several years before, um, essentially kind of this pristine data set where um, the songs hadn't yet been played on the radio. And could we go back and analyze that data um, retrospectively to see if there was something in there that would have predicted a hit? So that's exactly what we did. Um, I'm not going to go into the technical details of the analysis, but basically it focuses on, this is the same region that I, I mentioned before, where it's, this is the, the nucleus accumbens. These are the regions that activate when people like things or they expect to like things. So we can focus on that region. And then all we did was we went to Nielsen. Well, not really. We paid Nielsen um, to give us the privilege of accessing sales data. And all we did was just, we went back and we uh, aggregated all the sales data for the hundred or so artists that we had played originally and just asked, is there a correlation between the number of units sold subsequent to the experiment? First thing about sales, most songs are dogs. Um, so th this, is, this is a plot of, here are the number of, of songs sold. There's a million, okay, that, uh, that, whoops, that makes a gold record. Um, we have a couple out there, but most of them just don't sell. So we have to uh, do some normalization on our data set. And then what we found is we look at, here's the activation of that specific brain region versus the number of units sold. This is a, a log scale. Um, you see a big cloud here, um, but there is actually a correlation going on there. Um, the correlation of R, R is 0.32, which means that roughly the activation in this brain region in this group of teenagers explained about 10% of the variance in sales data, which is not huge, but the fact that there's anything there at all is actually quite surprising. We can, we can tease it down even further. We can actually construct um, what we call a structural equation model linking the likability of the song directly to the number of units sold, and these being the two brain regions. 
So if you think about it, it kind of makes sense where there has to be a link between kind of the thing, the song, and the number of units sold, and that thing has to be the human brain. And so this shows that pathway. And then we can do all sorts of other analyses. We can take a couple of brain regions and plot the activity in those two brain regions against each other, and the size of the circle here shows how many units were sold of the song. The thing to notice is that there's more big circles up here than down here. The little circles are kind of peppered throughout, but there's kind of a specific combination of activity of these brain regions that's associated with selling more songs. And then so finally people want to know, well, can you actually predict a hit or what is going to become popular? And the answer depends on what do you mean by a hit. Um, if you mean a gold record, well, the answer is no, because we didn't have enough gold records in our sample, at least prospectively. If we had, I'd be a producer. Um, but if you relax the definition of what a hit is, from a million to maybe 100,000 units um, or so, then we can actually start to distinguish based on the brain data which songs will sell more or less than that threshold. And in our data set, actually, the magic number is kind of around the 20 to 30,000 um, mark, where it does a reasonably good job of, of separating um, this is the non-hits from the hits. Um, it's like, think of it like a uh, medical test, a diagnostic test. You have to set a threshold to balance against false positives and false negatives. Um, final slide. Um, there was a study by Duncan Watts done several years ago where they, they tried to use um, internet searches to predict the success of three different uh, media, uh, movies, video games, and music. What's, what you can get from this plot, here's uh, movies, video games, and music. Music is actually really hard to predict, much more so um, than video games and movies. Um, so the fact that we're getting anything at all um, is, is quite significant. Um, the reason I think that, m that music is hard to predict is there's just so much more of it and the cost to make it is much lower. So um, basically the idea is we can actually start to forecast um, cultural trends by looking at relatively small what we would call neural focus groups. So thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for a couple of questions from the audience, please. Um, <coughs> I'm sorry. Oh, you're, you're, okay. Please go ahead and look at the other side. I'm interested in knowing if you can track or trace anatomically with the brain studies um, the transition of particularly adolescents who are in groups where attempted brainwashing or conversion uh, attempts are made, can you track the changes in their uh, thinking anatomically, and if so, the possibility then of predictability as to who would be susceptible for various types of education or uh, brain change in um, thought process? Um, interesting question. Um, so the, the study that started the, the, the the precursor to the music study, the, the original study that we did was focused on peer pressure. So that's kind of the closest, I think, that I can address that question. Um, what we found in that study um, was that there was actually a, quite a bit of variability in which teens were most susceptible to this simple idea of what song is most popular. And in essence, what we found was that the younger the kids were, the more likely they were to be susceptible to it, meaning that they changed their preferences based on knowing what was popular and what was not. As they got older, it didn't seem to matter as much. So that's kind of the only data point that I have that kind of bears on that, that there is probably an age effect, younger being more susceptible than older. Beyond that, don't know, didn't find anything with IQ or education. Yeah, I had one question about a slide in your in the first part of your talk. Um, because you had made a fairly sharp, but I'm sure a first approximation distinction between rule following on the one hand and utilitarian uh, uh, processes on the other hand. But the 
summary slide showing you know, who would sell out and who wouldn't and, and so forth had three categories. There was the deontological guys and the utilitarians and the neithers. And the neithers seemed to have actually more folks in it than the utilitarians. So I was puzzled by that. Um, yeah, that, I, I glossed right over that. Um, so, when, so when we followed up a year later um, with the subjects, we realized that we didn't really, we didn't ask them what they th thought they were using as the process to make their decisions. So when we prompted them again, we, we gave them those three choices. Are you doing it based on rights and wrongs, costs and benefits, or neither? And so that gave us some data on that. Um, what the slide was actually showing, um, I didn't explain it, is that the neither um, category, let's see if I get this right, sorry, the non-sacred items um, kind of were equally distributed amongst those three mechanisms. So it was, I'd, I'd have to show you again, but so if, if it was not sacred, it was kind of a toss up on how you made the decision. The sacred items though were heavily weighted towards using deontological mechanisms. So the plot was not for subjects, they were based on the item. So I noticed that you stopped short of explaining the relationship um, between the ventral striatum and uh, limbic activation to the behavior um, in terms of the song preference. So in terms of kind of you know, utility and implications of the study, would you interpret that the preference is reflected in the activation or does specific activation reflect um, song properties that may be correlated with preference such as um, unexpected rewards? So when there's, you know, a dissonance and then um, a more novel or more salient um, piece in the structure and that people just tend to prefer something that's more salient like that. Um, good question. Um, we actually did a fair bit of analysis um, on the sonic properties of the song. So, um, as many of you know, there are many, um, there, there are apps, for example, you know, Shazam, for example, can identify a song just by listening to it. There, there's a company called Music X-Ray um, that purports to analyze song structure and predict hits based on similarity. So we, we did many of these algorithms to see if there were specific properties of the songs associated with this, couldn't find anything. Um, although I will tell you that many of the top selling songs were metal songs. And we did not have a lot of metal heads in our sample. So there, yeah. there are many religious people in India, they have to listen to the song every morning, but they don't understand the word of that because it's in a different language. How, where does that fit in? Um, sorry, could you say that again? I didn't they, really they had to listen to the song every morning. It's yeah. a religious song, yeah. but they do not understand one word of it. They do not know the meaning. It's in a different language. It's um, I would say the same thing applies to many metal songs. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, a, it's the same question. We don't know, we, we really don't know what it is about the songs um, that is responsible for the activity or the sales. Um, you know, there's hundreds of producers out there that think they know, but they don't. Nobody knows what makes a hit. Um, we have to do is like, let, we're going to have a, a Q&A session at the end. It's an open panel discussion. What I would ask you to do is if you have some additional questions for any one of the speakers, and certainly for Dr. Down. And this afternoon we'll engage in open discussion. I want to make sure we stay very, very well on time so that, in fact, our program moves throughout the day in a, in a very, very efficient fashion. If you would, please, a big round of applause for Dr. Brown. So I think one of the things that comes out of any discussion like this, perhaps even implicitly, is all right, if these are some brain areas that in some way may be networked to mediate values, and these values are influenced by cognitions and emotions and engage particular environments to then perhaps influence, affect, or even drive our behaviors, does that make us some form of neural automaton? What is the nature then of going from value to behavior? How much control do I as an individual have in this? Is this some neuroscientific tool